It's day 52 where I'm going to show you how to stop your program crashing when you can't code around it. So here's a very simple version of what we looked at yesterday. This is just a program that's trying to load a file. You'll see as well that that file does not exist. It is not there. So when I try and run my program, the first thing that's going to happen is it'll try and open that file and it will crash. There is no argument and no code I can put in my F equals open code to stop that crash from happening. Because let's think about it in a wider context. What I could actually be doing is I could be loading a file that's on a memory stick that somebody could unplug halfway through. So the chances of an error on a file read are actually quite high. How do we get around that then? Well, we get around that with a new construct and it has two parts. The first part is try. Everything you want to try needs to be within that construct. So it needs to be indented in it, just like an if statement or a loop. It has a partner called accept. Now accept is what is that going to do if any of those lines of code actually crash? So if any of those lines of code actually crash, I'm going to print out an error message. So with a try and accept construct, it will try and do the code that's indented within it. If at any point that code crashes, instead of the entire program crashing, it will jump to the accept code and do that instead. So you'll see here that instead of my program crashing now, it's saying unable to load. So I could do some other stuff in there if I wanted to. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's amazing. I could put the entire program in a try and accept construct, and then I wouldn't have to worry about errors. If my program crashed, happy days. There is a problem with this. Try and accept is a great way of working when you're trying to make the end user experience as friendly as you can. In other words, if my NAN is using a computer program and it crashes, it's far friendlier for you to write a nice message saying, oh, I'm really sorry, David's Nan, but I'm going to have to stop the program because something weird's gone on. Just click start again and I'm sure everything will be fine. Otherwise, give your grandson a call. It's only the middle of the night. Don't worry about it. That message would be much friendlier to somebody using a computer that's non-technical than the sort of crash that we tend to get. The problem is, for us as software developers, and Yes, you can call yourself that after 50 something lessons, but for us as software developers, if my program crashes and I get a nice friendly error message, well, that doesn't really help me fix it. Doesn't tell me what line it is on, doesn't tell me what the kind of error is, and there's a bunch of problems with that. So we can extend except a little bit. So we can extend it by telling exception what kind of exceptions or errors to look for. In this case, capital E exception means every kind. If you're specifically looking for a type of error, I've put a list on the screen there that you can pick up and replace that word exception with. But the one I've used will capture everything for you. I've then done as ERR or error for error. And what I'm doing is capturing the error and giving it a variable name. That then allows me on line nine to print out that error and show a bit more detail. We could even get rid of that entirely and print what we've been seeing, which is called a traceback. You'll see here, I've just got accept again, and that'll capture every exception, but I'm printing out the traceback, which is the exact dump of the error message that I get as a programmer. It's quite handy to have during development. One thing that I do when I'm developing is I create a constant at the top called debug mode. And any of my tracebacks, I just put in an if statement. Now, at the moment, it's turned off, so I won't see those tracebacks. But if I need to see my error messages, I can turn them on. And very quickly, my program will start dumping code that I need to see. This means that I can error correct a program very, very quickly. And when I'm about to launch it, I can turn that back off and my Nana will be very happy. Go and try these programs, see if you can get your error message being avoided. It works with any kind of crash, including things like casting, where if we tell the computer that we want an int and the user types in some text, it would normally crash. We can actually use try and accept to avoid that problem. 
common problems with this code. First of all is this. It looks pretty good, but when I click run, we're going to get a major crash. And it's not really very helpful. It's telling us the problem is with the for loop on line 9. And that's not really where the problem is. The problem is this. Try is part of a pair. Try and accept. With that accept, it's not finished. So the reason it's saying invalid syntax is because the next thing it's expecting, unindented after a try, is accept. And there we go. I fixed it. As usual, I've broken a bunch of code. See if you can go and fix that for me. Your challenge today is to set up a pizza shop. Yes, I, I don't need you to go and buy ingredients. I don't want you getting your dough throwing on. And I certainly don't want you messing up your computer keyboard with a bunch of flour. What I actually want you to do is write a program that asks the user to type in a quantity of pizzas and a size. I would then like you to multiply those two together as on the screen at the moment and work out the cost for the pizza. I'd like you to store that in a 2D list with the user's name so that we can get to their pizza order. But here's the clever bit. I'd like you to use try and accept for two reasons. First of all, I'd like you to include auto save and auto load. And I'd like you to make sure that try and accept is used with auto load so that it doesn't crash if it can't find an existing file. The second place I'd like you to use try and accept is with that quantity of pizzas. Now you're going to need to use a cast to make sure that you're taking an integer there. And yes, an integer, because nobody wants to order 0.3 of a pizza. I'd like you to use try and accept to watch out to see if a user's typed in anything other than an integer there. And if they have, prompt them to try again. That takes a little bit of thinking about, but will save you a massive amount of time when you do this sort of thing for real. As ever, please publish it to the community and let us see it and share it with us using the hashtag replit 100 days of code on social media. Tomorrow is a project. We're going to be building a working inventory system for a game that has saving, loading and error correction. Yes, you've pretty much built the inventory system for any game you've ever played, unless you played it on the NES without battery backup.